Welcome all. I'm joined today by Dr. Nerses Kopalian, the Professor of Political Science at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, Dr. Kopalian recently penned an article for EVN Report titled The False Promise of Security, Why the Opposition Protests in Armenia Are Struggling to Gain Traction. So, Professor, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. To start off, you divide this article into two sections with regards to why the opposition protests are not gaining traction, in your opinion. I want you to unpack both. The first is the problem, as you put it, the problem of civic fiber. In the article you write, in terms of grassroots, diverse and bottom-up strategy of mass mobilization, the current protests are the reverse of the 2018 Velvet Revolution. So why is it the reverse when many are saying that the protesters are employing the same tactics as protesters did in the 2018 revolution? So there's a concerted effort at the initial stages to emulate the velvet. The mere practice of civil disobedience which the protesters and the political parties that are leading these protests have never engaged in or exercised, so they don't have previous experience, hence the need for emulation. Um, they're basically utilizing very similar tactics. The whole notion of blocking streets or quote unquote paralyzing the city, these were velvet techniques of civil disobedience that was used in Armenia uh, quite effectively that are being emulated uh, by the current protesters. So in this context, there is an attempt at utilizing the velvet techniques. But why, is, why do I call it a velvet, uh, reverse velvet? Because the objective is the reverse. Whereas the velvet was an attempt at a, at a democratic breakthrough, these protests, by virtue of the leadership and the political parties that are attempting to orchestrate it, uh, the objective is more of an authoritarian breakthrough because the leaders uh, very much are those that ran Armenia uh, prior to the Velvet Revolution. And in essence, Armenia was a soft authoritarian state as, as qualified. So this is what I mean by uh, a, a reverse uh, velvet as far as the uh, objectives of, of the given protest are concerned. But of course, uh, whereas the velvet was quite successful in the implementation of these various techniques uh, of civil disobedience, uh, these protests have struggled uh, to you know, gain the, the certain level or magnitude of resonance uh, that civic disobedience activities are supposed to produce. And when that happens, you do see a diminish in the momentum and the capabilities of a given protest movement. And the other section you titled The Problem of Leadership and Enthusiasm. You write that the current protests have a drought of charismatic leaders and more so there is a lack of clarity and cogent and uh, to, as to who is the singular leader. Uh, what do you mean by the problem of leadership and also the problem of enthusiasm? Right, so uh, fundamentally, um, there's this uh, tacit understanding in, uh, in, American, in Armenian society as to uh, who's funding these protests or, or, or who are the actual leaders. So you have two parliamentary forces, right? You have the highest on Dashing that's led by think, Robert Kocharian, and then you have the I Have Honor uh, alliance that's led by Sarah Sarkeesian. And then these two are organizing and leading these protests. So clearly it's no secret who the leaders are in that context. But then you have the issue of who the visible leaders are, which is basically it's Ishan Saratelian from the ARF, who's always up and about. And then you see Artur Vanetsian, who's up and about. And then you see Kocharians, for example, Son Levon uh, Kocharian, who's always active in there. So there isn't a cogent, singular, charismatic leader that is driving these protests, uh, where which, generally speaking, uh, the, the role of a charismatic leader is crucial to any protest movement growing and snowballing. So this was uh, one issue uh, that I touched up on. The second, of course, is also the issue of legitimacy. Uh, the, from, from the lens of democratic politics, from the lens of electoral politics, uh, the opposition forces did not do very well in the uh, recent parliamentary elections. And uh, to that end, the society has made a sort of a, you know, a very clear point on who they prefer to lead this country with respected options that are available to them. Right. So between the current opposition that is leading the protests and the government in power, society chose the government power. And so the opposition has been electorally rejected. And for this opposition to claim uh, a, a, the legitimacy to overtake this government or this discussion of forcing this government to, to resign and then having a so-called unity government which they will lead, this is creating a lot of suspicion in Armenian society. And so from the lens of Armenian society, 
uh, the opposition does not have the legitimacy to take over power because they have uh, proven themselves to be electorally impotent. So this is something important to, to, to gauge with respect to the, the discourse on the crisis of leadership. And so between lack of charismatic leadership, between uh, this is the deficiency that we're seeing in, in their strategic planning, from the whole geography of discontent, which was well utilized during the Velvet, but has struggled here, through the inability of these protests and these protest leaders to expand uh, their activities beyond from a very narrow few kilometer space of the center. These are all indications of uh, difficulties in having leadership that has a robust symbolism, that has a cogent agenda and a leadership whose basically presence resonates with a lot of society. So between the civic fiber and the problem of leadership, all these sort of you know weave together to suggest the various shortcomings that the current protests are having. Mm. And a lot of the supporters of the current protest movement have raised the issue of police brutality. The Human Rights Defenders Office has also announced that they will investigate and document some of these instances. Uh, what do you think about the conduct of the police with regards to these protests? So there's two sides to this discourse. Um, clearly, we have seen instances where uh, police officers have engaged in excessive use of force. But this is uh, common in any situation. We have a mass number of humans clashing with one another. So it's inevitable that certain utilization of force at some level is going to happen where hundreds of individuals are in a close proximity with one another. There's no avoiding that. But does that constitute police brutality? Certainly we've seen a few instances where police officers have hit protesters and cases have been initiated and they should be held uh, responsible to the full extent of the law. But at a systemic level, when we look at this, when we look at police conduct at the systemic level, the whole discourse of police brutality does not hold. Um, when we look at, for example, the behavior of the protesters, in any country, whether developed or non-developed, non authoritarian, or whatever the case might be, if citizens, for example, obstruct justice, if citizens push or hug police officers, if they basically resist arrest, if they obstruct police officers from arresting others, these form of behavior would lead to a proportional police response, uh, which would include, you know, use of force, handcuffing, use of batons, whatever the case might be. We saw what was happening in the United States from the Black Lives Movement, uh, Matter Movement. We saw what happened in France with the uh, Yellow Vest Movement. You know, uh, and you know, good luck doing something like this in Egypt or Russia, right? So, uh, citizen behavior, even within a realm of civil disobedience, if it violates the law, the police have a responsibility to enforce the law. In that context, that doesn't in and of itself constitute uh, a police brutality. And so when we look at the behavior of the Armenian police, minus the specific instances that we've addressed, which are, of course, are they're being held accountable for, uh, Armenian police don't use handcuffs, they don't use batons, we haven't seen water cannons, we haven't seen gas canisters. And so when we speak of police brutality, the concept has a specific meaning. Um, loosely using the term as a blanket statement is inconsistent with the way the concept is uh, utilized when actually talking about brutality. So overarchingly, I think the police have done a very consistent job of meeting their responsibilities and maintaining public order. Have there been shortcomings? Of course, that's inevitable. But that does not qualify uh, to, to the extent where we say there's systemic police brutality. That, that, that's to be uh, quite clear here, that, that that's intellectually dishonest when you misrepresent uh, something of this magnitude and pick and choose instances and say, well, this is reflective of entire police behavior. So in that context, uh, there are certain limitations, obviously, wishing to be addressed, but there is no systemic uh, police brutality. There's no evidence of that at the systemic level. Mm -hmm. And one of the points many of the supporters of the protest movement I've spoken to are making is that Armenia is facing an ex existential crisis. It's facing aggression from Azerbaijan and Artsakh's Armenianness is directly at threat. They would argue that this issue should trump all other issues such as the, the economy, democracy, etc. Uh, what do you think about this narrative? What do you think about this security democracy dichotomy? It's a very interesting argument, and you know, if, if there are if there are citizens that consider uh, the what they consider to be the, st the stability of non-democratic systems to be preferable to a democratic system, they have every right to believe that. And so, making fun of citizens or 
criticizing them for having diverse views is unacceptable from my lens. So they, they have every right to hold that perception. But when you look at scholarship, uh, broadly speaking, from an academic perspective, there should be no empirical evidence to suggest that less democracy leads to more security. That's just, there's no substance in that. And so the concerns that the protesters have and the rest of Armenian society has regarding the security of Artsakh, that has nothing to do with the current protests from the lens of broader Armenian society. The Armenian society does not view the current protesters as being the representatives of Artsakh, nor do they view the current protesters as having the sufficient legitimacy or the skill set to solve the security issue of Artsakh. So the problem here isn't the issue itself. I think there's broad consensus in Armenian society that the security of Artsakh is a serious problem, that it does need to be addressed, and it's the most important problem in relation to the problems that Armenia has. But denying democracy to the Armenian citizen is not going to solve the issue of Artsakh. There's just no causal relationship there. And so to create, try to create this dichotomy, you know, it has proven itself to be a false dichotomy because during the previous elections, society voted a certain way, and even during the current situation, these protests aren't resonating. So I mean, society isn't buying the whole uh, dichotomy of, you know, uh, security over democracy. In essence, healthy security requires a, a robust democracy. And so those are the interacting factors. But overarchingly, the point that I would like to make is that the policy concerns of the protesters are quite legitimate. No one could deny that, right? When we're talking about the security of Artsakh, addressing the security, whatever concerns there might be with the negotiations, these are legitimate issues. But the protests aren't defined by policy issues. The protests are defined by demanding a change in leadership. And broader Armenian society's point is that if you want to do that, you have to do that through the ballot box. And if you're not going to win through the ballot box, you cannot impose your terms upon rest of society just because you disagree on given policies. And so the argument on policy is in itself problematic. But to suggest that democracy should be rejected, that the will of the Armenian people should be rejected, and by virtue of doing that, we will secure the issue of Artsakh, there's no argument in that. There's no proof of that. There's no demonstration of that. And this is why I don't think that those arguments are resonating at this point. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the supporters of the protest movement, a lot of the leaders of the protest movement, such as Aspram Karpeyan, Naira Zorabian, Ishkan Sagatelian, and others have made it clear that they plan to continue until the government of Nikol Pashinyan resigns. So where do you think this is heading? So that's a very uh, interesting position that they've taken, and understandably so. Um, you know. Armenia takes great pride in its democracy and its burgeoning democracy and these uh, movements, the civil society uh, movements that we had in, in the Velvet are being replicated by uh, the opposition forces in the current moment. And um, this is something that we need to embrace, whether we agree with it or not. Civil disobedience is important, pressuring the government on policy issues are important. but. Claiming that you will continue to have a protest indefinitely until you get what you want, and what you want is inconsistent with what the rest of Armenian society wants, this is problematic because now you have a case where which the few are attempting to impose their will upon the many. And that, of course, is not going to resonate. So where do I see this going? The current government has been quite uh, clever and methodical in depoliticizing these protests. They haven't commented on it. They haven't engaged on it. They have refrained from sort of amplifying or validating uh, these protests. And so my assumption is that as the protests slowly fizzle out, because protest fatigue is a real thing, so is an enthusiasm gap, and it's not sustainable. And as you keep seeing you know, a few thousand protesters engaging these activities, um, as it slowly fizzles out, I don't see this as an issue of uh, the national government. This becomes more of a local issue. And so potentially, I do see uh, the Yerevan mayor or the, or the council of elders uh, d demanding the sort of, you know, uh, the closure of France Square and so on and so forth to, to be stopped because technically these are illegal protests. They don't have licensing. And so this becomes a municipal issue. And so should the municipality, should the city of Yerevan determine to address this, 
then I think uh, there's some uh, mechanism that could be that will be utilized by the city to bring the protest to an end. But I don't think you're going to see an order from the prime minister, and I don't think the prime minister has the right to give an order on uh, anything of magnitude to shut down the protest, when in essence, this is basically a Yerevan city issue, and it's not a national issue. So I do see this becoming a municipal issue where the city will attempt to address the protests down the line. And then uh, how that proceeds, of course, is open to discussion. But uh, you know, it, it will not go continue indefinitely because you're also having this concern that rest of Armenian society is also becoming kind of fed up. Uh, there are concerns from a lot of citizens who live in the area where their lives are being disrupted. That you know, all these unnecessary headaches that are, uh, are being created, and there is no end resolution to it. So. I don't uh, think this is going to get to the national level, and it should not. Uh, and this is clearly a municipal issue, as are protests in any country, and it should be addressed in that fashion. Mm-hmm. And finally, pr- Professor, I'm wondering how you think these protests are being viewed outside Armenia, for example, in Azerbaijan, and maybe in the wider international community. I wonder if you could comment on that. Right. Um, so clearly, anytime you have protests in, Azerba- in Armenia, Azerbaijan views this as very, very problematic because they can't do the same thing in their country. Right? So you know, for, for Azerbaijan, for the average Azeri citizen to look at Armenia and to see, for example, anyone could join a movement where every night you're insulting the prime minister, which is your right to do, and every night you're marching on the streets and expressing your political will, this is something that, of course, they wish they had, but they, they're they never going to have under the existing regime in uh, Baku. So in that context, you're seeing uh, collective envy on behalf of the Azeri citizen with respect to developments in Armenia. So in that context, this clearly demonstrates the relatively relative health of Armenian democracy, that citizens can be aggressive, and rightfully so from their viewpoint, in opposing the government, and they're allowed to proceed for months on end, uh, as we're seeing. So that is how I would, I would ter- interpret it with respect to broader uh, Azerbaijani society. As far as the, uh, the government in Baku is concerned, I don't think uh, these protests really are affecting their calculus. And if they're considering this protest to be a signal of weakening, right, or, or, or sort of a, a thing of fracturing our mean society, they're clearly misunderstanding these developments. So in that context, uh, I don't see these uh, protests being viewed in a, in, in a fashion in Baku, which is going to lead to geopolitical thing, uh, fallout or complications. From the Western lens, uh, I have spoken to various uh, journalists and various ambassadors, um, and they view these developments uh, within a context of an opposition expressing their views and a government doing a fairly excellent job of allowing these protests to continue continue as a sign of democratic uh, expression. Uh, but uh, also, when they pose the question, what is the, why are these protests taking place, uh, most understand who the leaders of these protests are. And so the same suspicion that resonates through much of Armenian society, hence the reason why the protests aren't growing, also resonates with much of the, of, of the outside world when they try to understand why the protests aren't thing, uh, resonating and they realize, oh, because the head of the protesters are the same people that Armenian society rose up and kicked them out of power in 2018. So this, you know, this very interesting element of self-negation is playing out. And I think uh, much of the outside world is seeing that. So the resonance has been quite limited also in the outside world, whether it's in the West or even in the East. Uh, you know, our Russian partners have been very, very have been very straightforward about this. They view this as a domestic issue, and it should be addressed within the laws and confines of Armenian society, which happens to be the view of every other uh, partner of Armenia that I've spoken with. So in that context, uh, the, the, the way it's being interpreted in, in much of the world isn't uh, the same as it's being interpreted, for example, within the Armenian diaspora. Okay, so so the diplomatic realm understands the nature of the protests, as does Armenian society, and I don't see that having any effect on Armenia's relationship with any country, for that matter. Well, Professor, thank you as always. Thank you for having me, and thank you for joining us on Civil Net.